Hello, good people of the internet. John Perry here. Today I'm going to be talking about <laughs> three different concepts of a gene that exist and are used in modern biology. This is kind of frustrating because you would think that science would... I mean, there, there, there are language issues everywhere. People use different definitions of the same word, and this causes communication problems in pretty much every walk of life, right? But you kind of think that the scientific community would not do this. They wouldn't have multiple different definitions for the same word, but they do. And within the field of biology, there are several different concepts of a gene. And I'm going to go over those concepts here today. I just released a new animation on the Stated Clearly channel, if you haven't seen that yet. It's about the selfish gene concept. When I was doing that video, I realized that I'm talking about a gene in a way that a lot of people, because if you look in a textbook, most biology textbooks today, you're going to find a definition of a gene that's what I would call the biochemistry definition of a gene. And the selfish gene concept, the genes I view, is based on the population genetics concept of a gene. And they're different in fairly important ways. And so I figured it's probably time for me to do this sort of clarification video. And hopefully teachers will find this helpful because I'm sure students get confused by this all the time. I used to get confused by this all the time. It is a bit of a mess. Before I dive into the three different concepts of a gene, I think it's, it's worth noting that the word gene comes from the word genesis or generate because genes generate an organism's traits. And it's good to keep that in mind. The gene generates a trait. That was the original concept of a gene. And yeah, we'll see that we have actually kind of slid away from that in recent times. But uh, that was the point of this word to begin with. So here we have the three modern concepts that are still used. There's the classical concept, which I'll talk about first. It's used less often nowadays, but it is still used. And that is really simple. A gene is a unit of heredity. And this comes from Gregor Mendel. He never used the word gene, but he talked about these units of heredity and he discovered them while studying pea plants. Here I have two peas. One is yellow, the other is green, and the yellow one is also withered. Uh, it's, it's wrinkled. And what he found is that these traits, the, the wrinkliness and the color, they're actually encoded by different genes, different units of heredity. And he figured this out because if you breed them together, it actually takes several generations to tease out these, these differences, but you can actually get unique peas. You can get a yellow smooth one. You can get a green wrinkled one. These traits shuffle. They don't mix, they shuffle. And that was this big breakthrough that Gregor Mendel made for us. It doesn't, it might not sound like that big of a deal, but this is a huge deal. This enabled us to just make huge breakthroughs in plant breeding, in animal breeding, and it helped us really understand eventually genetic diseases and so on. Like you can, you can be a carrier for a genetic disease, even if you don't show it yourself. It, yeah, it's really, really amazing what Gregor Mendel was able to figure out. That's basically it. A gene in his view, he didn't use that word, but a gene in his view is just a unit of heredity. And if we want to kind of do the, the pro version of the classic concept of a gene, we would say that it is a unit of heredity transmitted in the gametes, so in the sex cells of an organism. I mean, bacteria don't have sex cells. You could think of an entire bacteria as being its own sex cell because it, it reproduces directly, but a unit of heredity transmitted in the gametes and capable of independent sorting across generations. That was this big, really cool thing that he found. These things sort independently. They are preserved. They are shuffled like cards. They are not mixed like paint. They don't get destroyed when a couple comes together to mate. Their unique traits don't get destroyed. They simply get shuffled together and dealt out to their offspring. They can be teased back out again. In the classic view of this definition of a gene, we are agnostic as to the actual substance that genes are made of. We don't really know. We know that somehow they're contained in the gametes and the sex cells, but we don't know what they're made of. That had changed by the time that the field of population genetics really took off. 
by that time we knew that chromosomes contained genetic information. So here we've got some chromosomes. And let me just back up to Gregor's slide here. These traits that he talked about and that he studied, they sorted independently really easily. And the reason they, they sorted independently and so easily is because they existed on different chromosomes. And when a sex cell is being produced through the process of meiosis, whole chromosomes are actually shuffled and mixed between the, the male and the female and dealt out to the offspring. So you have really easy shuffling. When traits, when genes exist on different chromosomes, independent sorting happens really easily. However, if you have two genes that exist on the same chromosome, they will be what we call linked traits, linked genes. So a good example of this is actually, I think <laughs> Darwin wrote about this. I think that's where I read about this, is that if you breed a pigeon to have a long beak, it'll also have a long feet. For some reason, the, the beak length and foot length are linked traits in pigeons. That's kind of annoying if you want a short-footed pigeon with a long beak. But what we actually learned is that even if you do have linked traits, they can become unlinked. It just takes a long time. It doesn't happen quickly in just one generation. Over multiple generations, they will eventually end up getting separated because chromosomes during the process of meiosis, they, that, they go through a process called crossover where different chromosomes can actually uh, swap material with other chromosomes and allow linked traits to be unlinked. One of the things that you might be thinking of when you see this definition, a stretch of chromosomal material that influences an organism's traits, how big is a stretch of chromosomal material? Exactly how big is that? And unfortunately, with a definition like this, we can't get very specific. Frustratingly, we can't easily count genes. Richard Dawkins tried to address this in the Selfish Gene book. He says that a gene is a portion of chromosomal material that potentially lasts for enough generations to serve as a unit of natural selection. This is frustrating because when you have linked traits, natural selection can't work on them individually. It works on the, the gene and the other genes that are linked to it at the same time. So really, if you're looking at short time scales, natural selection is basically seeing an entire chromosome as one gene. Now, that's not completely true. Chromosomes, actually every generation, they will do crossover, at least one or two crossovers. So basically, natural selection sees half of a chromosome as one gene, if you're just looking at one generation. If we want to expand this definition, it'll look like this. A gene in population genetics is the smallest stretch of chromosomal material that influence an organism's traits and sorts independently at your time scale of interest. So if you're looking at just one generation, again, that's, you know, a gene is half of a chromosome. If you're looking at millions of years, you might be able to break a chromosome into hundreds of different genes, and you'll, you'll be able to watch natural selection working its way through each of those little tiny chunks. But the frustrating part of this is that a gene is not well defined. It has incredibly fuzzy boundaries, and those boundaries change according to your time scale. So that's annoying, right? This is where the biochemical definition comes in, kind of to, to try and save the day and make counting easier. This is Watson and Crick with their DNA model. As we started to understand DNA better and crack the genetic code, we were able to look at sequences of DNA eventually when the human genome was done, and we could tell whether or not they coded for protein. And that ended up becoming the definition of a gene, a stretch of DNA that codes for protein is what is considered a gene. And finally, they could count these genes. So in the human genome, we have about 20,000. I say about 20,000 because it is a little bit tricky to count them. There are pseudogenes and there are, yeah, it is a little bit messy, but in general, it's a lot easier to count these types of genes than the older genes that it depends on the time scale you're looking at, right? So here we've got a little drawing of a gene. And a gene is typically between 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 6th base pairs in length. So they're pretty long. Yeah. So a stretch of DNA that codes for protein or acts as a template for a functional chain of RNA. That's also something that we now consider 
a gene to be. And I say here in, in this definition, I've written that it's a stretch of DNA or RNA because viruses, a virus genome, is, a lot of them are written in, in RNA, not in DNA. They don't use DNA at all. Well, <laughs> they don't store their genetic information in DNA. They store it in RNA. So there you go. Seems like this is great, right? The biochemical definition should be the standard. And it is the most common definition that you find. It's the one that you find if you go to Wikipedia. You will find this definition. If you look in most textbooks in the glossary, you'll find a definition similar to this. I, I mean, this is my custom written definition, but it, they're going to give you something like this. A stretch of DNA or RNA that either codes for protein or acts as a template for a functional chain of RNA. And you might think that's great. We've solved this problem. Everybody should just adopt this definition of a gene. It's easy to count. Problem solved. Except for the fact that there are lots of stretches of DNA that do not code for protein, but do dramatically affect an organism's traits. That's the big problem. And just think about this. Let me go back to my first slide on what a gene is. First slide of this whole conversation here. A gene, the word gene, comes from the word genesis, or generate, because genes generate traits. Gregor Mendel, he was concerned with, you know, what is it that generates these traits that I see in these pea plants? The whole, the whole point of coming up with the concept of a gene was to think about this. There's something that is generating these traits, and that something is being passed from parent to child over multiple generations. But then our obsession with counting genes without any sort of ambiguity and in our quest to count the genes, we ruined the whole point of really defining what a gene is. It's even worse when you realize that there was actually a different definition for what we now consider a gene. There was a word called cistron. A cistron was the original concept for a stretch of DNA that codes for protein. That was considered a cistron. So we already had a word for it, and we could have used that word, but instead we took the word gene. And today, if you are a biology teacher, it's hard to navigate this with your students. If you're just a normal person that wants to be able to read an article in the newspaper about a gene, about genetics, you're going to get lost. It's, it's really easy to get lost with these crazy contradictory definitions out there, you know? Well... A couple years back, I did an animation called What is a Gene? And I was confronted with this. My solution at the time, and I'm pretty happy with this solution even today, was to make my own definition <laughs> that's general. So normally making more definitions is probably a bad idea because then you have more confusion. But what I did is I came up with this, this simplified concept, not really a definition of a gene, a simplified concept of a gene. A gene is a stretch of DNA that codes for something, usually a protein. And this I have found is really helpful for students. They can easily go from this definition. Let's say that they learn this in high school and then they never go on to study genetics in depth later. They, they don't take an interest in it in college or whatever. This is good enough. They can read most popular articles about genes. And if this is the idea they have in their head, it'll suit them just fine. If they decide to go into genetics and they start learning these different definitions of genes that exist, this definition that they learned when they were in high school, it's not going to, it's not going to trip them up. They won't be confused because of this. And this is a problem when you, when you simplify a concept to teach it, you know, to, to first year students, a lot of times you end up simplifying it in a way that it, they have to unlearn the simplified version to learn the more detailed version. And I was very careful in coming up with this description so that they wouldn't have to do that. I think maybe the one thing that I aired here, it, I say a stretch of DNA. Well, of course, as we mentioned earlier, some viruses have RNA instead. And so that's something I guess you could say that a student would have to unlearn. But I think that that's pretty minor. In hindsight, you know, years later after making that animation, I think I probably could have got away with just saying that a gene is something... <laughs> that generates a trait in an organism. That actually is a decent general description of what a gene is. So anyway, I hope that was helpful to you. I hope you're not now more confused than you were before you watched this video.
jargon does get messy. It gets confusing. Uh, it, it's very important, even even in science, when you think that there's really clear definitions for the words that people are using every day, it really is important to make sure when you're talking to someone that you're both talking about the same thing because these language issues exist all throughout science. Uh, it's just the history of how things are pieced together, uh, the the different camps that end up popping up in science. There is no pope of science. There's no one to kind of come in and rein things in. So we actually have this, this uh, definition problem exists all throughout the field of science. So it is what it is. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that little explanation. So long for now. Stay curious.